For our CRTV, I'm Sean Kinney, and welcome to HetNet Happenings, where we take a look at all things DAS, small cell, Wi-Fi, and much more. Welcome back to HetNet Happenings. We've got a great show for you this week. As our regular viewers are quite aware, the folks at RCR spend a lot of time on the road traveling to trade shows and conferences to really keep you up to date on what's going on in the telecom industry. One of the preeminent shows that we cover every year is LTE North America, which was held just two weeks ago right up the road from us in Austin in Dallas, Texas. I wasn't able to make it up there this year. Uh, last week, we took a look at the Wireless Technology Forum Analyst event. I was out there, uh, had my hands full, but our colleagues Kelly Hill and Joey Jackson were able to attend LTE North America. They produced some really comprehensive coverage, both written and multimedia, that I'd encourage you to check out on rcrwireless.com as well as our YouTube channel. But I did want to share with you a few brief highlights from the show uh, particularly around network infrastructure, which we're all about here at HetNet Happening. So we're going to hear a little bit about DAS, we're going to hear about small cells, then we're going to take a little forward-leaning look at a 5G, particularly 5G as it applies to carrier R&D and ultimate commercialization. So in this uh, first clip, we're going to hear about DAS and uh, CIPRI, which is a former TE connectivity, currently Comscope, that's who's selling CIPRI air interfaces. This clip is really about the integration of distributed antenna systems with the radio access network and using CIPRI to sort of bridge that gap. So this is a big deal in our industry and has a lot of implications, particularly for in-building wireless connectivity. So in this clip, this is uh, Luigi Tarazzi, who is the manager of embedded solutions up at Comscope. Let's take a look. So first of all, let's start with the problem, right? So we know that 80% of the mobile data station actually occurs indoor. So that's, that's where the problem is, right? So uh, if you want, you can, you can say that, you know, those are the new, the new cell sites, right? But unfortunately, those cell sites are now standardized like any uh, macro cell site. So they are all different. They are all different because they have different aspects, different features that they have to be considered. So they have different size, they have different capacity requirements, different access requirements. So maybe it can be a private band, it can be a public band. So it can be multi-operated, it can be single operated. Different infrastructure constraints, different uh, requirements in terms of antenna location. So all of them are different. So what we are talking about today is trying to define the right architecture to address most, if not hopefully all of those, of those scenarios in building one scenario. So uh, before defining the architecture, I would like to briefly discuss about uh, a key aspect of our network, which is uh, interfaces. So uh, those are the key interfaces that we have today in an LTE network. We have obviously the uh, RF interface, or if you want to call it you know, a 50 ohm antenna core, that's what we use today to drive, for example, a DAS, a distributed <coughs> antenna system. So as obviously some benefit, which is, is extremely flexible, you can connect whatever you want, you can whatever source of RF signal you, you want to the system. So it's a perfect multi-operator source if you, if you want to use it. Obviously, it's, it's definitely uh, has some problems in terms of uh, you know, cost of, of the interface. So uh, you, as you know, we need typically for a DAS system, you need a head end, you need a point of interface, you need to uh, condition the ref signal before feeding the DAS and so on. That's also we have cost space to the to the to the system. The next one is CIPRI, so the, uh, what I call it the custom private rate interface. So it's it's not really a standard, but uh, we believe that uh, potentially is an extremely power interface because uh, what we found out and I will show you some data later on is that having a direct CIPRI interface from a BBU all the way to a DAS and then that's provides a huge saving in terms of optics, capex, and performance to your system. So far, we can say that DAS has been part of, it's part of the heterogeneous network, of course, it's part of the toolbox in the heterogeneous network, but it's not part of the RAM. So far, DAS has been just a kind of a, uh, it's an ancillary element connected to a base station with the RF interface here, right? So it's just, from a DAS perspective, the base station in the RAM is just a black box. We don't know anything about it. So, 
And that, as I said, has some benefit, but also has some disadvantage. Then, I mean, what we are seeing right now is that uh, OEMs are starting opening the SQL interface to, to, the, to the DAS community. And what we found out is that you can actually have a DBU connected the DAS event, driving directly the DAS. And that's obviously, it's, it's what is being already implemented today. So it's, it's a kind of, a, you can call it as a kind of a first step towards the network, towards the RAM integration from a DAS. It's the first step. I mean, it's not the final probably, but it's the first step. So from DAS over to small cell, we're going to try to hit everything that I spout off in the tagline for you on this one. And uh, you'll remember a few weeks ago, we visited the small cell forum show and we spoke with Alan Law, who is the chairman of that group. And one of the small cell forums predictions as it relates to small cell market outlook in 2016 and the sort of two to three year short term is that the real growth opportunity is going to be in the enterprise market rather than the carrier market. And uh, this all involves around the CapEx and OpEx. For small cells to be rolled out by carriers on a national level, that price point has got to come down. One way to do that is through virtualization and the analysis that you're going to hear in this next clip essentially compares a small cell to a Wi-Fi access point. If you can make small cell as easy as Wi-Fi is to deploy, you can really do something powerful in terms of expanding the reach of these small cell networks and adding a lot of density, particularly in metro areas. So I think that's a really salient point, and this is going to be excerpted from a uh, panel discussion. This is Haig Sarkeesian from Wireless 2020. He's moderating exchange with Art Cloud from uh, Art King, rather, excuse me, from Spider Cloud, and then with Eric Collard, who's from Micro Semi. Let's take a listen to this discussion. My last point is really what answers your question. So we have a patented algorithm that we use in all the timing uh, devices that we have. And the basis of it is to take several types of inputs, you know, in the traditional timing uh, environment, E1, T1, SYNCHE, PTP, GPS, etc. And from that multitude of inputs, we derive precise timing and sync. That's what we have as a patented algorithm. In this particular case, we use this algorithm not to derive multiple types of syncs, but to take m a multitude of GPS signals that are very weak and make sense out of, that sig of those signals and derive precise time out of that. So that particular algorithm is what I would call the secret sauce. And once the, you get product. it, you share it with the rest of the network through the wiring infrastructure? So yes, yeah, so like Amit said this morning, you know, it's uh, the Ethernet you know, network that is present in the enterprise is really the neutral host infrastructure for us. So we connect this device through an RJ45 to the rest of the in, uh, infrastructure network. So this is kind of the alternative to the first picture I showed. So you don't have the, the use of the GPS antenna on the roof anymore. The small cells are where they need to be. So you know, depending on the site survey of the small cells, the small cells are deployed in the building where they need to be. And the timing product is deployed where it needs to be in terms of GPS acquisition of signals. So you know, ideally, not too far from a window, in a higher floor, if possible. So there's a lot of flexibility. Uh, but it doesn't need to be on the same floor as the small cells. It needs to be in a location that makes sense for itself. So it's kind of uh, dissociated from it. And it's connected to the small cells because the small cells are the client. And this device is the server, the master in, in the 1588 parlance. So they are connected to each other via Ethernet. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. We're going to switch to the other presentation that has the questions. And I'm going to ask a few questions and then open the floor for you guys to ask questions of our panelists. So, uh, Art, let me start with you. Why are enterprise small cells important? What problems do they solve? And do they solve it for one operator at a time? Or is there a small cell solution that you can come to a building like this one and you can install a small cell that works on the AT&T network and the Verizon and the Sprint and the T-Mobile? Real simple. Enterprises are wanting small cells to make their mobile devices work right and to make the employees and, and the tenants in the building stop complaining that their phones don't work. I mean, netting it out, it's just that simple that they want service. And you know, enterprise is an interesting market because you have IT buyers that are a decision maker for maybe thousands of people. So you have one person to talk to that influences 
you know, the, the satisfaction of a lot of downstream, downstream employees. So still a little bit of work to be done before we really see these large scale carrier small cell rollouts, but in the short term is a lot of value there for enterprise clients. And to go back to what I was saying earlier and, and what was addressed a little bit in that clip, uh, virtualization is, is a huge step uh, towards making small cell more uh, affordable for large scale deployments. You know, I, I'm familiar with uh, Ericsson's small cell product. It's called the Radio Dot. And it, just imagine taking the unit two screws into the ceiling, then scanning a barcode, and then that kicks into gear all of the uh, configuration processes, which is, I mean, that's a huge value when you're talking about a carrier like Sprint with ambitions to roll out 50,000 plus small cells. You really need something that makes that a scalable process to make it realistic. And so now I, I mentioned that we're going to take a little forward-leaning look at 5G uh, it's something we talk a lot about on the show, and it obviously gets a lot of uh, attention uh, in the telecom industry, but at the same time, 5G is not even standardized yet. I think we're looking at maybe standardization around 2020, which makes you wonder what exactly we're going to see when you hear Verizon talking about small, or I'm sorry, 5G demos in 2016, and then we're expecting some larger scale trials in 2018 around the Pyeongchang Olympics in South Korea. In the meantime, research and development's going on in earnest with carriers and their vendor partners, groups like IEEE, 3GPP, they're working on the standard end. And the ultimate goal here is to provide sort of ubiquitous, ultra low latency, ultra high throughput for next generation applications like uh, the tactile internet, for instance. That's a really exciting one. And then uh, the sort of the, the level of throughput that you need to really support autonomous driving on a large scale. So in this panel discussion, this is moderated by Chris Pearson, who's the president at 4G Americas. We're gonna hear from analyst Phil Salas, and we're gonna hear from Mark McDermott from T-Mobile, and then from Brian Daly over at AT&T about some of the work that these carriers are doing to get us towards 5G mobile networks. Let's take a look. Progress is going on, on 5G. I want to start, Phil. Thanks, sir. Um, well, I'm going to start with very quickly, and it started moving, moving before um, formal, the formal um, standardization process began in, in, in research um, groups around the world. And even before those like research collaborations started, companies are, are working on R and D and, and, uh, and patent, patenting their uh, inventions. So now we're at the stage where officially, where you know, the process for standardization is going forward. So I think right now we're making a lot of progress. What do you think about the progress of life? Yeah, maybe just to, to make a couple of comments. One, uh, you know, we all like to see the standardization engine level the faster. The challenge is that, you know, there's a lot of constituents these days, so um, clearly progress in standardization is key, but I see a lot of opportunity around 5G to exploit some of the use cases uh, progressively, uh, and maybe you could deliver some of those comments to some customer benefits. Feel that those advances can be made by 2020. 
I'll start that. I think yes. I, I think we're seeing some of those advances being put into the building lots of, of LTE advanced standards now, uh, and, and they'll continue to build on as we approach 2020. Um, I think I think it's a relatively comfortable time frame. Uh, anything before that certainly might be a little rushed. And, and yeah, I, I guess the bottom line is you know, let's 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 take the time to get those major advances built into the standards. Yeah, I think that's right. There's something that's been on with 5G that's kind of interesting in the sense that it's promising a kind of performance angle in many different dimensions that is way beyond what we've got today, right? That's the, the promise. And if you look at some of the, well, that most applications that live on the web today, uh, the web is an architected uh, or laid out in a manner that's going to be able to use that performance angle. Um, so it implies, I think, at some level, we'll have to take some of the applications and distribute them quite deeply into the network to obtain the performance benefits where it makes sense. And I think that piece is going to take a, a bit of time. Uh, 2020 seems like a reasonable horizon. Uh, but it's going to be driven by, by you know, businesses and enterprises that have real needs. Uh, and that's the, we should follow that very carefully and so forth. Like, no question. Um, yeah, from the analyst perspective, you yeah, can yeah. look at this for your clients. I, I also think you, know, you, you can't have all of those performance specs at once. You can't have you know, high data rate latency with low power, low power consumption, low cost. Um, so that will come eventually though because of advancements in silicon development. But um, the early part of the market is going to be focused on the high speed of the work. And, and um, you know, I think the industry is looking at it the right way in terms of trying to group the use cases into you know, high speed and um, mission critical and you know, mess like your IoT devices with waveforms tailored to those. And, and it looks like one of those waveforms is really OFDM and it's going to be FT Vans Pro. So that's really 4G. So between CAT 0 and 1 and narrow band LTE and LTE Vans Pro, LTE has an extremely long life left in it. And meanwhile, LTE, um, 5G is going to develop for the very high speed applications. So that was a really interesting panel. That was a very brief excerpt of it. I'd encourage you to look at the whole thing, but one of the really salient points that came out of that is, uh, despite all this emphasis on 5G and, and what we can do with 5G, still a really long runway on LTE. When you think about uh, places that not necessarily in the developed world, a lot of the Middle East, a lot of Africa, there's people still using 2G networks. They're very commonplace. So. We're talking about 5G. A lot of the world's still using 2G, so a lot of work to be done left with our LTE networks and, and still a lot of innovation that could happen. So I'd encourage you to check out the rest of that clip. And so I appreciate you joining us to take a look at LTE North America, and uh, we've got a lot more content up on the YouTube channel from that if you're interested. And, you know, I just got back yesterday from San Diego where we were out there for the IEEE Globecom show. 5G is another huge emphasis there. I mentioned that they're one of the leading organizations working on the standardization. So there was a lot of talk at this show about 5G and what's being done to get us from uh, lab trials and prototypes to actually commercial, commercially viable networks that can support these services. So we're going to take a closer look at that show next week. And then I will remind our viewers, we're going to take a little time off over Christmas and over New Year's, but we've got a lot of great stuff in store for you in the new year. I'm particularly looking forward to uh, the Consumer Electronics Show up in my uh, home away from home there in Las Vegas. Then in February, we're going to take you over to Barcelona for Mobile World Congress. So lots of exciting stuff. So thanks for tuning in to HetNet Happenings, and be sure to tune back in next week. HetNet Happenings is a production of RCR TV. To reach Sean Kinney or to suggest a show topic for HetNet Happenings, you can reach Sean at skinney at rcrwireless.com. On Twitter at Sean Kinney RCR. To find out more about the latest in HetNet and all things wireless, dig into rcrwireless.com.